Um, Eliza makes this amazing seven-layer salad. Ooh, yeah, yeah, you've, you've had it. And it becomes a, it's become a staple of a lot of our fa- hom- holiday family dinners. And she always makes it in this beautiful, like, trifle dish where you can see the layers from the side, very beautiful and ornate. And so years ago, and it was actually only three months into our marriage, with, which I think is a key fact in this story, I don't know what happened. We didn't have kids, so she wasn't upstairs getting a baby to sleep, but I ended up being the one to make the seven-layer salad on a Saturday night for the family lunch after church the next day. And me being me, the conflict-avoidant golden retriever, a human I am, who always aims to please, I was very serious about doing it right. I mean, after all, we had just been married, and I didn't want to mess things up. And so one by one, I start following the directions that she has texted me. Chop a head of lettuce and put it in the bowl. Check. Chop two crowns of broccoli and put on top of the lettuce. Check. Pour a bag of frozen peas on top of the broccoli. Check. Pour a bag of shredded cheese on top of the broccoli. Check. Pour a bag of bacon bits. That's where it gets good. Pour a bag of bacon bits on top of the cheese. Check. Cut green onions. Put on top of the bacon bits. Check. Season with salt and pepper or as you please. And there's only one more step. And this is where confusion entered my brain in association with the text of message she had clearly sent. Assumptions were made. <laughs> Faulty interpretation of directions happened. And um, what I thought was a very self-evident fact, I later learned was horribly wrong. Her directions read, put the mayonnaise on top and cover in plastic wrap. Not put mayonnaise or a layer of mayonnaise on top, but put the mayonnaise on top and wrap in plastic wrap. You see, we weren't going to be eating the salad until after church the next day, so when she said put the mayonnaise on top, I don't know what you heard, but what I heard was in an effort to avoid sogginess overnight, put the mayonnaise, as in the jar of mayonnaise, on top of a salad and cover it in plastic wrap. Then tomorrow we'll apply right before serving and it will be good to go. That was my assumption based on an early marriage interpretive misstep. So when Eliza walked downstairs to see my six-layer version of a seven-layer salad, I quickly learned how wrong it was. And in Eliza's eyes, it was so hilariously wrong it deserved its own Instagram post that will now live online in perpetuity forever because that is the actual picture of my seven-layer salad. Thank you. Not in a trifle dish, by the way, but a big old metal bowl. Um... (laughs) I misunderstood the intent, the purpose behind her directions. I read a different purpose into put the mayonnaise on top of the salad. You quit laughing at me, Ma. Um, (laughs) Here, (laughs) and so here's my point. If you don't know something's purpose, you'll probably use it wrong. Oh, it got deep there. And that's true in everything from a jar of mayonnaise to your life. Dr. Miles Monroe once wrote that the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but it's a life without purpose. See, purpose is one of those core questions we all ask, and we really never stop asking. Why am I here? What's the purpose in my life? What's the meaning in my life? What am I supposed to do with my life? And you see, purpose, however you come into this conversation today feeling full of it or none or disqualified or ashamed of how you've blown it or just living beneath what you think you're capable of, purpose is something that we all have, but many of us struggle to live a life full of. And in fact, if you were to gauge your life on some sort of meter of like satisfaction to frustration, if you find yourself on the end that looks a little bit and feels a little bit more like frustration, I would venture to say that an underwhelming experience of purpose is part of that dynamic. And that's the reason some of you like right now walked in the room a little frustrated this morning. It's because you don't understand your purpose. You grew up maybe like like many of us on a steady stream of talks about purpose and calling and destiny. 
destiny. But you've yet to connect the dots between those spiritual concepts in your daily lived life. And so maybe you're walking in and walking through most of your life and you're just asking, like, what's the point? Why bother? Maybe you're in a job that you're busting your tail at and nobody seems to notice or care and you're like, what's the point? Why do I do this? It might be you're trying to parent and guide your teenager and all they show you is rebellion and disrespect. Like they're just so mid. (laughs) That's as bad as my Australian. I've got two strikes this morning. Come Holy Spirit. (laughs) Let's get to the, come on. What's the point? Why do I do this? It might be that you're fighting for your marriage and your spouse doesn't even seem to care at all and you wonder what's the point? What's the reason why am I doing this? Maybe there's some of you and you're trying to serve God and you're trying to just be faithful, but no matter what you try and how faithful you are, life seems to continue to go wrong and it's disappointment after disappointment. You're saying, why bother? Why do I even try? Purpose is something we all have, but many of us struggle to live a life full of. And so maybe that's exactly how life finds you this morning. And you've been left existing, but not really living. You've lost your passion, your zeal, the energy, the desire to wake up and do something to make the day count. You feel adrift at sea, and you don't even have the motivation to put the sail up or turn the engine on. Maybe you've lost your why, or maybe you've never really found it. And if that's you this morning, let me let you in on something that's real for a lot of people, regardless of how we communicate at the surface. You're not alone in that. Welcome to this messy journey called life. And if you're newer around here, where you find yourself today is not a community where we will try to con you and manipulate you, guilt you, or shame you into pretending that you have purpose for the sake of performance and appearances, but we wanna walk with you and journey with you beneath the surface that begins to wake up those questions from the core as Jesus has made you to make contribution in light of his purpose in your life for the sake of the kingdom and for his glory. Purpose is part of the mess. And so we're going to talk about purpose for a few minutes, and we're going to let Moses be our guide. And let's catch up for a second. A few weeks ago, we saw that Moses encountered God in this burning bush moment. We've been in chapter 3 for a while now, haven't we? It began with this relational call. Moses, Moses, I want to know you. I want to have a real relationship with you. And so it started to work with Moses how it always works, that as we get to know God, we get to know his heart and we get to know what he's actually like and to know God's heart is to know his love and his concern and his deep care for his people and their suffering and their pain for Moses God calls him to that intersection point of his purpose and the world's pain that was in his people when he said go to Pharaoh and get my people to freedom And I don't want you to miss this because there's a principle right up front of how purpose works for Moses and throughout Scripture and even for you and I this morning. For Moses, it's this, that that the closer he got to God, the closer he got to God's heart. And what is God's heart all about? It is, in its essence, love, which means he is lovingly concerned about people's stuff their suffering, their pain. And so when he calls us into purpose, his purpose, as we'll see, it's always connected to his care for people and their pain and their suffering. Does that make sense? The question that you ask about why am I here and the other question I hear about all the time is like, if God cares so much, why doesn't he do something about people's pain and suffering? His answer might surprise you as it did for Moses. Is it that God's plan all along has been for you to step in the gap of care and concern. Moses, Moses, I want to know you. At the burning bush, I want to know you. Now we've got some stuff to do together. You see my heart. What's in my heart? Care for people and their pain. What's your life about? That. There's always that rhythm. In our text, God said, I have seen the misery of my people. I have heard their cries, and I am concerned about their suffering. I have seen, I have heard, and my heart breaks. Over and over again through Scripture and in your own lives, we have these experiences where the fact that God sees and God hears and God's heartbreak is actually a very real thing. And he cares so much that he 
It's not distant and aloof and doesn't care about pain and suffering and people's struggle. He cares so much, actually, that he does do something about it, and he did do something about it. And he says to Moses, I will rescue. I will bring my people out of this land of darkness and into a land where they thrive. So what's his answer to this problem? What's his plan? How does this intersect with your epic question of why am I here? His plan is his people. It's his church. It's you and it's me. And it is us together. Now, imagine being Moses. Pop Bible quiz for you. How old is he at this point of the journey? Old. He's like, he's like 80 years old. Now, I know he lived a long time, but like, he's, he's old. And he's been a shepherd for 40 years, which is not a very like positionally powerful or respected office culturally, especially to Pharaoh and Egypt and what they're trying to build. It's like in today's society, people are like living with AI and we come to them and we're like, we're gonna take over the world with our typewriters. Like that's the gap between this experience economically and positionally in society of a shepherd to Pharaoh and his people. And Moses is pretty pumped, like God, finally, something's got, you're gonna do something about my people? I blew it 40 years ago, I've been wallowing around in shame, but something still needs to be done. I'm not the guy, I did it once, I did it in my power, I blew it up really badly. And Moses here, God says something six times. He hears God say, I, I have heard, I have seen, I am brokenhearted, I have come down, I will rescue and I will bring them out. And no doubt Moses is like, yeah, God, go do your thing, man. I'm glad that you're going to do it. But he wasn't expecting that next line. So Moses, how am I going to do all those things? I'm sending you. That's a pretty sharp left turn for an 80-year-old shepherd. That's a pretty sharp left turn for the mom that's just surviving, trying to keep up with laundry. That's the pretty sharp left turn for the, the dad who's like, but if I choose a different path, I can't support my family in a way that we've gotten used to. That's a pretty sharp left turn for the single person who longs just to find a person and they don't feel, they feel incomplete and purposeless without it. That's a pretty sharp left turn turn to this epic question of people's pain and suffering when he says so I I I I and by the way I'm sending you you see very often God's answer to the pain of the world is his people it's his church and that's not only not what we expect if we're honest it's not really what we want at times God I've got a decent life over here on the sideline Raising some high-quality kids, drinking some high-quality H2O. That's three strikes. I'm out. <laughs> I would prefer you do it. Send someone else. Send, send the pastors. Send, send the leaders. Send my small group leader. Send the superstars. Send, send, uh, no, no, I, I, I got it. But that's God's pattern. And, and I want to interject something right in here of, that's really important to this story, and it's really important to the journey of purpose and really just life itself, is are you tracking in Moses' story over and over again that God presents himself in a way that we can't control? In a burning bush, to the disqualified 80-year-old shepherd, to the I will do it, I will do it, I will do it. By the way, I'm going to send you to do it. And honestly, whether it's purpose or other areas of life, we have become very good in our approaches to spirituality of trying to control God. We do it in a lot of ways. One of the ways we do it is we turn God into just a hyper-focused God of all morality. All he's doing is counting the good you do and the bad you do. And if you and I can respond to that by just doing enough good, God will owe me something for being good for him. 
That's one way we control him. On the opposite end, we control him by turning in him into such a God of love that that love comes with no truth telling, with no demand, with no correction, and no rebuke even at times. We'll see later that God's anger burned at Moses because of the way he denied God's invitation into purpose. And a God who is all of that is just a God that we don't owe anything to. But when the real God shows up in your life, when he take his, takes the uncommon circumstances of your pain and your trials and your missteps and your personality and your passions and all the ways that he created you and he steps into your life in such a real way, you discover that you can't control that God. And in fact, if God is who he says he is, you owe everything to him, not the other way around. That's how purpose works. You and I, when we apprentice our lives with Jesus, are following a God that you can't control that's actually good. Sometimes the God, and here's my point in that little riff, sometimes the God you can't control invites you into purpose you don't expect. Tim Keller has this amazing line, He says that religious people find God useful, but Christians find God beautiful. You go ahead and throw it up there. Religious people find God useful, but Christians find God beautiful. So I want to lovingly and pastorally ask you a question. If, If purpose is one of those deep aches in your soul and in your life, and you came in today frustrated, and we're naming some things that are really resonant with you, can I ask you a question right at this, this intersection of control and purpose and ask you if, what if part of your struggle with purpose isn't because you've been searching and can't find it, as if it's not there or purposefully confusing, but what if it's about surrendering to God's version of it instead of your own? What if the search for purpose and our haziness that comes around it sometimes has more to do with our attempts to control God than to surrender to God? We'll see that Moses had some big time excuses and reservations when the God he couldn't control showed up in that burning bush, said, I'm gonna rescue, I'm gonna rescue, I'm gonna rescue, I'm gonna rescue, and I'm gonna send you to do it. In John 17, Jesus is praying for his disciples, the, what's known as the high priestly prayer. And, and he says this, like, I'm coming to you now. He's talking to his father. But I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they, you and his disciples, may have the full measure of my joy within them. And then a few verses later, he connects joy and purpose and Jesus' sacrifice and all of those actions into this outcome. That as you sent me here into the world, I'm sending them into the world. So in an era, in an era where purpose is one of these words that means nothing and everything, if you're a church person, a lifelonger, you have heard your fair share of messages about purpose and destiny and calling, and you've been inspired, and then you've come and you've joined the team, and then you burn out, you flamed out, you had the moment where you hustled, and, and it, the inspiration became perspiration, and the perspiration became a lack of motivation, and the lack of motivation became pontification, and the pontification became abdication. That was a moment. So maybe you're left asking today, like, what, what do you mean by purpose? What, what is God getting at? Because again, in a cultural moment, inside and outside the church where, seems, where purpose sometimes gets hijacked to be about your influence and not your faithfulness, or where God is seen as a stepping stone into your grandiose plans of purpose rather than as the cornerstone in your experience of purpose, you gotta recognize that number one, your purpose isn't for you. Your purpose is God's purpose. 
Moses wasn't inviting him into a lifelong journey of self-discovery. He was inviting him very specifically into his redemptive plan for his people. He heard, he saw, he was heartbroken, he came down, I will rescue, I will do something. And Moses, this is the exact point of the story where you are invited in. Christopher Wright, an Old Testament theologian, once famously wrote, he said that mission is not ours. You can use the word purpose the same way. Mission is God's. It is not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world, but that God has a church for his mission in the world. It is God who sees. It is God who hears. It is God who's heartbroken. And God brings us close like he did relationally with Moses. Moses, Moses, come close. I want you to know my love. But while we're here together, this love isn't just for you, bro. I've got something for you to do in the world. And that's true for you as a person individually. And it's true for us as a church family which further reinforces this idea that we say around here that I hope becomes not just a concept in your heart, but like a driving passion of, or in your head, but a driving passion of your heart. It's this, that like Bridge Church, like we don't exist as a haven from the world. We exist as like a portal like of heaven for the world. Jesus, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How? His church. We don't, we don't need to curate and strategize our own mission in the world. We need to join God in his purpose in the world. And he is actively doing things right here. In you, in your workplaces, in your families, in your neighborhoods, on your teams, and in your day-to-day monotonous job. What if the work that you do is the very point in which God is inviting you to interact with his people who are full of pain and suffering? And just like Moses, the invitation is to you and it is to our church. Come close, come close. Let me love you. Let me heal you. Let me tell you who you are. And while we're here together, this is so that you can see their their hurts too so you can hear their cries and so that you can begin to share a peace of my broken heart. And what if one of the very reasons that there are people home today hurting and curious and skeptical and disillusioned about God and his bride, the church, is because for far too long we've ignored this aspect of who we are in Christ. We just want the burning bush, but we don't want to go to Pharaoh. So we become chasers of the burning bush moments. We become curators of the burning bush moments. We create classes to reinforce the burning bush moments. We study the burning bush over and over again and we fail to recognize that what happens in us is meant to happen through us. And that the transformative work of God's love and grace that is changing us and healing our identity and mending our broken hearts is meant to come back out of us for his people. What if the prayers that you pray for the people you love, God would answer your prayer by sending you, not someone else. Not by changing the circumstance, but by helping you be with them in their circumstance in the same way that God just promises to Moses over and over again, yeah, I know you got problems with this plan, but don't worry, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. The prophet Amos, hearing from God, once rebuked Israel, and this is Eugene Peterson's version of it, and he says, like, I can't stand your religious meetings, actually. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. Listen. When you meet God like Moses did and you start to develop a real relationship with him, you will surely hear him say, I love you. 
I love you. I love you. But it's not just to hear him say, I love you. It's to hear him say, I love them. Will you take my love to them? That's who God is. That's the missional heart of God. Your purpose, it ain't for you. Your purpose is God's purpose. And number two, you don't find your purpose you serve God's purpose. Now, surely there is a discerning work and calling of how you fit, and that's a good coffee conversation and really its own teaching series, but, but there's a corrective point to this point today. So many of us are on this epic search like hamsters on a wheel, just out there looking to find the thing that feels good and clicks and makes sense and controlled instead of yielding to the God who's like, yeah, but... Quit searching, just surrender. Quit searching, just surrender. And I get it, I get where that comes from and I understand it, but, but I wanna name that there are dynamics of the culture and the, the way we view the, the autonomy of the self and our Americanized version of personal freedom and all that sort of stuff. It, it mashes itself into a church culture that becomes about our purpose fitting our preferences rather than fitting God's needs. And so, I don't know whether it's out of our own deep sense of insecurity or our egos or our pride or our feelings of inferiority that are all part of this mashup of living out our purpose in our lives, but one problem I see with a constant search for purpose is that it becomes less about finding purpose and more about finding validation. And validation needs to be part of someone's journey, but validation is not the end. Eventually, there's this moment where a validation is, has served its purpose to love someone. But then it's time to change, and it's time to heal, and it's time to grow, and it's actually really a call just to trust God. That was Moses' core question. Who am I, God? Yeah, send someone else. Yeah, I, I, I got a stutter, man. I, they, what if they don't believe me? If God, all God was interested in is validating his concerns, I don't know that, that the people of Israel made it out. Who knows? That's highly, highly speculative stuff. When we go on a search for purpose, disconnected from God, we just turn life into one big experiment. So there's the two principles I wanted to bring to you. That ultimately purpose isn't for you, your purpose is God's purpose. And you don't find your purpose as much as you serve God's purpose. You, you find how you were custom designed to fit God's purpose, not to curate or strategize or innovate your own. And so that's great. I like that, Matt. That's a, maybe a slightly different take on the thousand versions of purpose I've heard before. Thanks for not working the word destiny in there so much. But you're like, well, okay, so what does God, I mean, that's great. What, what does God want me to do? What am I supposed to do? How, what do I go different like now? I want to do something. I want to fix the world. I want, I want to solve the problem. I want to, I want to have significance and meaning and change the world. Let's do it. I love it. And your inspiration is real and that's great. But what you don't need is a peak moment of inspiration. You need a way of life to sustain yourself to let God say, I love you and now give that love to them. Yeah. I love you, I love you. I give that love to them. Give that love to them. I love, I, I love you, Nate. Give that love to them. Love you, Nick. Give that love to them. And name by name and life by life and story by story, this thing becomes sustainable in community when you organize your life and the desires of your heart and the intention of your mind and the affections of your being to experience and grow in God's constant stream of pursuing love that he's reassuring you with. And then he's also lovingly reminding you that, hey, give that to them. Give that to them. So where do you start? Here's one tip. Start with where you feel the broken heart of God. What was God doing with Moses? He was sharing with him just a sliver of his broken heart. 
God sees, God hears, God was brokenhearted. I will, I have come down, I will rescue, I, 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 I am sending you. And there's a, there's a paradoxical thing of grace right there. Because God loves you enough and calls you and believes in what he's inviting you to do with him so much that he would share that piece of his broken heart. But he also loves you enough to not share with you all of his broken heart. Because that would crush you and I. It would crush our church to try to take on every need of the world and in this community. So there's a discerning act of your life that says, where specifically do you feel the broken heart of God for his people? And very often, the way you discover God's broken heart is when your heart gets broken. And that's, that's a tough thing to experience, and it's even a tough prayer to pray. Like, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. That is a, that is a prayer to pray. But what if purpose is actually more like that? Unless some crafty analysis of the needs in the community and a demographic factor of socioeconomic levels and statistics and all that stuff has its place. But what if there's something underneath that prayerfully just asks God, like, where are you sharing your broken heart with me? As you look across the valley and you live where you live, like, we've got homes filled with stuff, but empty of meaning. Empty of life and life to the full. We have homes that look great on the outside, but inside it is abusive. There are marriages floundering and there are single people just lonely and widows and widowers longing for human connection. We have kids who are at risk and vulnerable, kids in foster care or on the verge. All throughout the valley, we have people who've built their identity on things that are ultimately fragile and a bit temporary. And as long as no one diagnoses that reality, we all play the same game. We just carry on at the surface saying hello at the fields and in the gym and at wherever and just never asking the deeper question because we're too scared to be our true self. You have people who've been hurt by religion and are now on a very messy or painful existential quest to rediscover God or just shove him to the side once and for all. You have people who feel unwelcome and unlovable and you have adults still reeling from childhood trauma who are in the throes of anxiety and depression and even suicidality in a state with very little resources but a lot of stigma. Start where you feel the broken heart of God. Where do you feel God's pain? And Moses is exactly like the rest of us. He had some issues with the God he couldn't control. He's a man, not some superhero, and odds are, I think he's the type of guy that would put a jar of mayonnaise on top of the salad. (laughs) Just makes me feel better. And so he has this reaction to God. Go read chapter three and all of four where his real reservations come to the surface, Moses felt four things. He felt unworthy. He said, who am I? Who am I, God? Then chapter four, verse one, he felt unimportant. He said, what if they don't believe me? I mean, not only who am I to do this, but what if they don't believe me? I am a lowly shepherd who walked into the Egyptian empire riding a donkey. Nothing says power. An influence like walking into the empire on a donkey. He also just felt unimportant. He felt unskilled. Like, I'm not up for this. I'm not a leader. I can't even give a good speech. I can't talk. I'm nobody. He's Pharaoh. He has all the power. I'm not up for this. And so he he lays his excuses to God. And God's response, I love it, wasn't even disagreement like, no, Moses, you've got more skills than you think. No, I'll, you'll, be, you'll be all right. His, his response is, yeah, I know, Moses, but I'll be with you. 
But this wasn't meant for you to be able to do on your own. This wasn't meant for you to be able to do in your own strength. Of course you're not skilled enough for this task, but, but don't worry, dude. I'll be with you. Why? Because it's always been about God's purposes, not Moses's. In your life, it's not about your purpose, it's about God's purpose living through you. I love you. Now show my love to them. And what I find really hopeful about this today is that that means that even when you take the tiniest of steps, because, aside, let's not create the hype machine this morning that I want you to quit your job tomorrow morning and change the world. I want you to live your life with a different set of intention underneath it. Living life, knowing Jesus, becoming like him, and doing as he would do if he were in the very normal contours of your daily lived life. So parent with so much purpose that your heart explodes with receiving God's love and giving it to your kids. Work with so much purpose that your heart explodes experiencing God's love and giving it away. And what this means is that even in the tiniest steps into your purpose, you have the full weight and power, to, power and sovereignty of God behind you. But those weren't the only excuses Moses gave. There was one more. And I've teased at it a couple of times already. And this is the one that's far more resonant with me. Moses says, I'm unworthy. God says, I'm with you. Moses says, I'm not important. God says, I'm with you. Moses says, I don't have what it takes. And God says, I'll be with you here. I'm going to give you leprosy and your staff. will look at that next week. He demonstrated all the things. Moses felt inadequate, underqualified, and disqualified. I think I've said all those things, too, along the way. And then Moses said maybe what he wanted to say the whole time. In verse 13 of chapter 4, Moses says, send someone else. He was unwilling. He was served, invited into the deepest, most fulfilling, satisfying reason for his existence on planet Earth. And things got real, and fear crept up, and his reservations ended with, send the next guy. Don't want to. That's rough. I mean, let's humanize that. That is brutal. And in my heart, I'm thinking like, Moses, I get it. But I'm also thinking like, watch out. Watch out. And this is a bit unpopular to say today, but actually, when we're unwilling, we should watch out. God up until this point with Moses is patient and kind and reassuring. He's saying, I get it, don't worry. I'll be with you, I'll help you. It's all good, Moses, let's do it together. He's like a mom or dad just encouraging his kid. And in Exodus 34, we see the first description of who God is, that he's slow to anger, but he is slow to anger. And God hears Moses say to him, just send someone else, I'm unwilling. And in verse 14, it says that, then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, even the poetry of God appeared to him in a burning bush to give him purpose, and then in response, when he's unwilling, his anger burned towards him. Anger from God? That's actually understandable, because remember, like, remember, God every day hears the cries of lonely disillusioned men and women in the valley right now who just need a friend who will love them and accept them and you and I are sitting back closed off like I've got my people my life's full send someone else I get it when every day God sees the pain of children at risk right here in our neighborhoods and our schools and we say ah but I'm still trying to get through season two I get it when God's heart is broken for the 14-year-old boy in your kid's class who is struggling with his gender and feeling comfortable in his body. And rather than giving him a loving relationship for the very difficult journey in front of him, we write him off, throw him aside, and politicize the whole thing. I get it when God sees the pain of the world and the darkness in nations and that are keeping on purpose the light of the gospel at a distance. And the church of Jesus Christ is going, can we just have another gathering? Another study, another class of is that's the goal instead of your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
So I send you. I get God's anger. But here's the deal. It would be very self-righteous of me to say I'm God in this story because I'm not. I'm Moses. I'm unwilling. I feel inferior. I feel unlovable. I feel like I can't. I don't want to. That is too much. You and I are not God. Let's not pretend that even if we believe and we know the right answer to this story, you and I don't live as God in this story. We live as Moses in this story. And far too long, we as people and as a church, the church, have been content to judge the world without the hope of the gospel instead of going to the world with the hope of the gospel. How does that happen? Moses, Moses, I love you. Now show them. Moses, Moses, tomorrow, when you go to work and you're surrounded by people, take my love with you. Go show them. God sees it all. And he's coming to you and I. And he's saying, I hear it. I see it. Let me share just a sliver of my heart with you and let's go together. Purpose shows up every day in front of you and it's in the form of people. And the question that I think God wants to invite us into, again, this is not the whole conversation that's impossible to have in the time we have on a Sunday, but I think the question I want to bring to you as your pastor today is not a journey of discovering more about your purpose and your calling. It's a question of, are you willing? Will you take that invitation to love people, serve people, to serve God's purpose, to surrender your life without reservation to the God you can't control, to the God that gives purpose through your pain and is inviting you to be part of how he redeems every square inch of creation and every square inch of your life. Are you willing? So would you stand? I have this phrase that just keeps sneaking up in the back of my brain this morning and I want to take the risk to bring it to you and if it's resonant then pay attention and if it's not resonant pray for the person who it might be resonating with so come Holy Spirit come Holy Spirit speak to your people And this is the phrase. I kind of have an image of like a kid walking around a park. Maybe a baseball field. On their own. They're not really with anybody. And then the phrase that keeps coming to my brain is that not all who wander are lost. Not all who wonder are lost. And so maybe that's what the journey of purpose feels like for you this morning. Like a kid at a park alone, wandering about. And people are concerned like, hey, whose kid is that? Is he lost? Is she lost? Do they need help? But really... They're within the line of sight of the people that love them. And what looks like lostness is actually just wandering. And that's exactly where God would want you today. Because someone who's wandering about is open to finding their way back home. Opening, open to surrendering the control. It feels like being lost, but really you're just wandering a bit. And so if that resonates with you, I I would just 
ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate that more deeply to you. And there's others here this morning that purpose feels like a forgotten friend. Something that you're disqualified from or that's for the elite Christians. I'm definitely not one of those. And your life is just a game of comparison and shame and my life will never add up or stack up. But yet, God is breaking your heart for something, for someone. And so maybe the invitation to others in the room is to find contentment in the purpose when everything is screaming at you to be comparing your purpose to something or someone else. And so Jesus, would you make these reflections real to your people? For those that it resonates with, that it be a powerful moment of clarity or transformation or change or a change in direction, maybe repentance. Jesus, for those that are on the search, would you redirect their search to a more abiding, connected, slowed place of surrender? To the God who's mapped it all out, who has a purpose for every one of us, who sees your pain and my pain and the world's pain and he invites us into it. Would there be some sharp left turns in our stories today? Some sharp left turns in our church for your glory, so your kingdom comes, so the lives are changed and so the giants fall, and so that as you bid us to come and know you, be loved by you, you transform our heart in such a way that we can't help but to say, yeah, I see it now, I hear it now, I'm broken hearted now, it's for them and I will go. In Jesus' name.